start. My name is Tom Brensick. I was in the company Transfer Fix. Just quickly about us. We're probably the oldest transfer printing paper company in the world right now. There's not many left of us. And we offer a collection of designs for 50 years now. So we have designers and we produce transfer paper in the most sustainable way possible. Essentially everything is recycled by transfer decks. We have creative teams in France and in Germany making new designs. We're always constantly offering these designs are production ready. It's the difference between these art studios. They sell you a design and you have to convert it to a printable uh, uh, data. We essentially have been doing this for a long time. We have no development costs for our customers and we also accept customer designs from all over, from many brands. So that's pretty much what our thing is. But what I'm going to do today is, is kind of walk through uh, the history maybe of how we got from being analog to becoming digital. Because this may be sound strange, but it doesn't seem to me that it's not many, not many people are aware of this, this history in the background of what it means. Certainly, it's, I'm talking about the history of graphic textile printing. We're at a textile fair, so that basically, um, let's quickly, let's quickly our, our factory here in Germany, not too far from here. We're in a smaller town outside of Frankfurt. And um, why I'm talking about graphic textile printing, because textiles have been printed for thousands of years. That's been proven. And in fact, in Europe, since the 1700s, there's been rotary screen printing going on. And that's a rotary screen machine. And that's the bulk of things, but that's not graphic. Graphic is photorealistic printing, which has become more interesting now that you have digital. But it's not new. There was photorealistic printing well before digital, as things were still analog. So that basically, photorealistic graphic printing on textiles first became possible through transfer printing, which is essentially being able to put a print on a paper, because paper is a good substrate for photographic printing, which a textile is not usually. And then you could take this paper and convert it and transfer it to a textile. So that's the actual beginning of graphic, photorealistic printing on textiles, which we started in 1970. So that's basically 50 years ago. Now, we actually were in this business longer than that. This is kind of going back. I had one of our first print catalogs that, uh, this is from 1909, where we were already making designs. We had designers back then making designs selling them in export markets. We've been doing that since about 1870. And so we, we've had a long history of working on paper, making designs, and making designs to be commercial, because that's what we always did. It was always, this is in three languages already. So the French and English and German. So that's kind of where we came from. But the way we print this paper to become photorealistic was transfer paper. That's basically, using a roto war machine. This is some sort of piece of people may not know. This is basically, those are steel cylinders which have copper and through photography, analog photography, you could present a picture on these steel cylinders which are engraved onto it, one for each color. You can't have mixture colors now. So this is basically what roto war that's the, that's the a microscopic picture of a recess in a printing cylinder, which is where the inks go. It's called an intaglio printing, which means it's recessed down, not like relief printing, which is like going up. That's the part that prints. But in any case, this is the machines we print on. Very big machines. To have the stability, to have a photorealistic print, to print anything you want to print. 
These machines are perfectly stable. They're sitting on tons of concrete just for stability in the foundation. This is, this is analog print. I happen to know this actually from a long time ago because in the 1970s I was living in Chicago and I was working for a big printing company. And this big printing company was the second biggest one in the world at the time. And we had factories and several factories and they had just built a new factory in 1977 in Mississippi of all places. And this factory was a broken door factory that was going to print this magazine. It was one factory, four big machines, printing 13 million copies of this every month. This is considered the finest graphic print in America at the time for mass market, talking about mass market printing. And this were, these were rolling over machines, the same machines Transcortex uses today. So, and then he, at this point, Transcortex continued this. This is our rolling over tradition, this is our thing. But we also were very early, and perhaps the first, that were moving into digital. 1981, I moved to Germany, and I couldn't get a job anywhere except at Apple Computer, a new company in Germany, in Europe. And at that time, they were, when I just left at Apple to come to transfer text, this machine was brand new. It was the very first Macintosh, 512 KB, kilobytes. So that's, uh, and this machine, I mean, to be honest, I was at Apple. Nobody thought about graphics at Apple. Nobody. The word desktop publishing did not exist yet. But I brought this to Germany, to, to transfer text, and there was one guy, particularly, who read right from the beginning, he couldn't believe it. He said, wait a minute, this thing here, I can make a design with that. And this is this guy, I gotta show him. I mean, the poor Carl Heinz Kohl. He was a crazy man who from the very beginning was obsessed with making digital printing. And essentially, we, we, we just took this little Macintosh and he ended up making a first cylinder with that engraving, his printing, using a stripe design. It's a plain old black, white stripe design. But he did it. He had to get an image projection machine, exposure machine to make the image come on and go straight to this film. So basically, this film could be then replaced. Why do I say film? Because in the old days, we had cameras. And we took films. I can basically show you right here an example. This is one I just dug out from one of our our archives, since we had thousands and thousands. In the good old days, the artworks were literally artworks, paintings, highest quality paintings to a certain extent. All designs were hand painted with finest details as opposed to Photoshop creations. They then would be, had to be, we had to photograph this with analog you end up getting these negatives, so I can show you some of the, the negatives. You had to somehow get this thing repeated, get it in repeat, and get this thing, these films, and they would start painting on it. There were people, and one of the guys is sitting here, they would be painting on this thing with a little paintbrush, blocking it out, making masks. Masks is the word for making these films that would they go back and forth, positive, negative, until you got a clean, clean, piece of film that looked like this. This is one flower, this is called Opal film, which is one film of one design of one flower, that flower design I showed you. So we have six of these. Of course, they all have to fit together. This is how you end up making, it goes onto a machine, a machine like, that's the scanner actually, I have to see if I got what else I've got here. That's the people working on the very first computers we had. And there's this film. That's this, the six films that make that flower design. And that is converted to an Opal film, which is black, white. And back then, before digital, 
you had a machine that could recognize, is it white or is it black? Is it white or is it black? Or is it gray? And it would, it would then make a hole in the cylinder for the ink to say, okay, it's black, so I'll make a good hole. Oh, it's not so black, it's gray, I'll make a gray that's smaller. So you have those different um, tones which give you the photographic ability. In fact, you have 256 tones for each color that you would have. We also could do uh, photorealistic designs. This was also well before digital. You see here it's a four color process type, which also the film is right here, which allowed us to make perfectly photographic realistic on textiles. So this is basically this design here. And what you have now is well, and actually, I maybe explain to his people and say, you know, you know what's he talking about? Why, why we do this? So what is analog? What is digital? You think people would know this, but it's amazing. Not really. And digital analog is basically waves. It's, it's basic. It's a continuous wave of information. People are analog. What you see is analog. What you hear is analog. Everything we do is analog. Digital came after analog because everybody was here before there was computers. And what you're doing with digital is you're taking intervals of this wave, intervals, and you're slicing them. One zero, one zero, one zero, one zero. So you're basically, see if I can get to this thing here. So here you go. This is an analog signal. This is what you're looking at right now. And this is what we're here, this is everything. This is digital. It's essentially taking that wave in slices and to try to get as close as possible to become analog. And that's, sorry, that's what it is. Digital is a copy of analog. It can only be a copy of analog anyway. There's no other purpose. And from the very beginning of computers, when I first started in the business, there was only bookkeeping type of computers. They were copying basically the, the hand ledgers that the bookkeepers would fill out. And then you go to business processes, where they were copying also the forms that the workers would fill out, saying this much was produced today and stuff. And then you go to music, you go to paintings, you go to everything. Music, that's one area where I think we all agree that almost anybody can hear the difference between a long playing record, vinyl, and that compact disc. You can hear it. And what are you hearing? You're hearing the analog wave, which is what music is. It's a wave. And then you're hearing a digital version of it, which is a intervals. So you can hear it. And you can see it, too. In any case, our first computers we shot for, because this little Macintosh was not going to go very far, so in the early 1990s, we invested in this machine. 500,000 D mark, Deutsche Mark, that's 250,000 euros, basically, for one box, 400, or 500 megabytes. Now we're getting some place. 500 megabytes. 250,000 euros. And we had to buy two of those guys. And so then we moved up. They gave up a new version, much smaller, that had one gigabyte. It was only about 100,000 euros. And then we moved on to the newest version from sil the silicone graphics. That first computer was the same computer that made the film, Jurassic Park. When they did those special effects in the early 90s, nobody knew how, to do, how the hell you do that with those dinosaurs. You need a big, powerful computer, which is nothing compared to your cell phone. But that's where we went to to get these, because we were so obsessed with going digital which I'm going to explain later. What else? The next thing we needed to do, after we started making these separations and getting rid of the film, how do we get onto that cylinder? Because we still had to go from the computer to make the Opal film, that white film I showed you, so you could then get this thing. So we said, we have to digitalize our engraving. 
So we're going to, the next process to digitalize is actually physically hammering into those cylinders, which we ended up doing. At the same time, pretty much, this became, a, this, of course, digital engraving became a standard very shortly in the, in the 90s. At the same time, 1993, Benny Lech Landa, I don't know if any people know the name Benny Landa, well, he basically presented the very first digital printer in 1993 at the IPEX uh, trade fair for the printing, and it was the first commercial digital printer. And of course, then everything was going crazy, because now you're saying, wait a minute, we've gone from making the, 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 the image of the design, going to making the actual print cylinders that go into big machines, why don't we just print the damn thing? And just do it and do it like digital too. So this was the next step moving this way, which we were definitely very interested in. We bought one of the first Milwaukee's that you could buy. And, and to tell you what, why, why we were so interested, because we said, if we get this thing to print correctly, we can eliminate this kind of stuff. Because the beautiful part about analog printing is nothing has a higher quality, nothing has more color consistency, and I talk about color consistency from first meter to last meter, I talk about left to right, and I talk about the order we did last week and the order we did next year on the same design. Color consistency, which digital doesn't come close to, but it's very expensive for small amounts. Like many customers in textiles like to sample, and so that sampling ends up being a pain in the neck here. So we ended up put it on a big machine, a little machine like this, a little printing machine, one by one, the cylinders, they put them in, they would, they had to mix the little pieces of inks, a little cup of ink, so there it is all complementary inks, we don't do CMYK, we're making complementary inks so we can change our designs as we like, with trends, and with summer, and winter, whatever. So that's what we're doing, so we said, if we can get a small digital printer to take care of that work, that'd be great. Because that's expensive, it takes me one hour to make that thing. But we found out at the beginning, of course, digital printers were also expensive. They were like, also, which I think our costs were more than 10 euros for one meter of digital paper in the beginning. And that's like, it wasn't completely competitive, not with our analog anyway. But uh, in any case, it did, did make it make sense only for maybe that kind of quantity. But we had another problem. How do we get that digital printer to print like we want? Because we know how that design is supposed to look. We have got a, what do you call it, a standard sample, or the Urmuster in German, which tells you basically that's what it looks like. That's what the customer is going to buy. And we have customers who are brands. I mean, these people don't screw around. They're going to say they want it like this, and it's going to be, you know, J.C. Pebbies, who was a big customer of our time, Burlington, etc. So in any case, how do we get that printer to print like that? Because they can put colors on paper, or put colors anywhere in digital printers. But controlling that was not easy, and it wasn't really never been done before, in that, on the level of perfection that analog has. So what we needed was to get that printer to do this, so we had to, since there was no affordable yeah, remember, it's the middle of the 90s. Those color uh, reading, those, those spectral meters that can read a color that you have today, and, you know, they didn't exist at that time. At least nothing you would, could afford to pay for, and it didn't really work properly. You had delta differences that were, you know, more than one. So it was worthless for using that to somehow get the colors calibrated for the digital printer. So we had to take a guy this poor guy, we stuck him in a room for two years with a team we had, and they took every color we had, and they say, and this color, for example, we have color systems like this. This is a, some examples of, I can say, 2,000 standard colors. We have four million colors in our library, but we make this effort for only about 2,000. And this is a color going from full tone down to the lowest tone, which, any dispersed ink, and people who know inks, will know that those colors move when they go down. They don't stay yellow. They don't stay like that. They have, each color has a color curve, which 
well, and CYK is very often ignored compared to analog. So these guys were trying to put these things on the monitor because we wanted to see it on the monitor of the computer, and then go to the, this machine here, the printing machine, and match each of these colors and the tones by hand with their eyes. So it took a long time. And maybe, maybe my point is, is that there's one reason, there's a good reason why not many people have done all of this, but we've tried to do. This is our color tabs as examples. We can see the tones. You can even see the, the color shift that you have a little bit on there. But uh, in any case, we move on. After that, the thing is we had the image in the computer. We now had our colors too. So the next thing we wanted to do was to basically say, okay, we can get this printer now to print decently a sample. So let's put that sample machine, not in Germany, let's put it in New York, in our New York office, where they would make a sample for the customers. Our biggest market was the United States then. They made a sample, and then we would print a digital printout, and then they say, okay, we weren't so perfect that we would just print 20,000 meters in Germany, because they told us so. No, but they'd send it to us by parcel, and we get this sample that they printed, and we print the whole thing, and save that whole time of samples going back and forth. So, at this time, we had a digital printer satellite. We call them satellites because we are able to put these satellites anywhere in the world. We have customers, we have retailers that have on their desks small desktop printers that can print an A3 size piece of transfer paper using the same inks and everything we do with our recipes, our designs, and they can print it and sample it in their offices, which uh, I know a company like Primark does this. So they're basically doing it, they put it, they hang it on the wall, they say that's what we want. Now we want salesman samples. So we've got to do that in another digital, we'll get, get to that point further, how, that goes, how this digital and analog make together can make an unusual combination that nobody has. Now, we also realize if we have the separations and we have the inks all in the computer, we could have some creative person come up, and that's based on of it very quickly. Well, I could make the colors and change them if I want to. So why am I bothering with all these tabs and stuff? I'll sit on the computer and just make new colors for the summer. No, it's now it's going to a fall season. Or what do we do with the designs? And we realize we can do this anywhere. So then, the customer said, why can't I do that? Because I want my own colors. So that became something that we started giving out to people, saying that they could uh, have the ability to see our designs virtually, digitally, see that in their offices, look to our collection, make choices, pick out colors themselves, and we have production true data. Now, this maybe sounds pretty simple, but it really wasn't because it was, you know, the years we've done this, and the, the amount of effort, you could have known how far you had to go, and how much effort and money it would cost. I don't think we would have started. I don't know. Because it's just, it's a ridiculous thing we had to do. But we had a reason. And this is the reason. We were heavily invested in analog. We have the largest collection of open line designs in the world, and they're all ready for production, ready to go. In a half hour's time, we can get them on a machine and we can print them. We got a large capacity of machines. So basically, each, each cylinder here, the, the, the raw steel is more than a thousand euros. So if you can, you know, just add up, you know, maybe like 25,000 of those things, that alone is a lot of money. And the problem is, that's just the material. Those things have designs on them. They are copyrighted designs. They are original artworks, and they are ours. Our, our customers, because we do many job, jobs for customers too, 
but people, we print almost all the soccer jerseys for, for, for the national teams and for the big clubs in, in England and Europe. That's our, that's our thing. They have a high standard, what they want. They want bulk quantities. That's our thing, bulk quantities. So that's basically designs from the customer. But again, that's worth money. All of this is very expensive. So we had a reason, we had a good reason to want to become digital light analog and not just digital like everybody else is doing. Everybody else just grabbed a CMYK machine and print. Way to go. And yeah, okay, that wouldn't help us. We had to make a bridge. So I always say we had no choice. That's still my only excuse. If I had a choice, probably shouldn't have done it. So now what is basically more than digital? If you read the title or, or if you read the title of the thing it says, analog to digital to more than digital. What is more than digital? Actually I didn't like that name because I wanted to call it back to analog because I think analog is real and but everybody said to me it sounds backwards, so you have to say more than digital. More than digital is basically considering that digital has become a competitor to analog printing in the meantime. And primarily because of the smaller lot sizes, just in time deliveries, uh, many small collections that some of the brands are doing instead of one collection a year or two collections a year. So you know, digital's been gaining on analog. I think most people know this. Just because it's easy, it's cheap for small quantities. So, but digital becomes something else completely when it becomes analog. When, when analog, I mean, you can compare it to, to almost like, well, you know, in the 1950, Alan Turek, who was this English man who was one of the early inventors of computer, he said, how, how do I know if a computer is thinking? How do I know if it's analog? I don't know if it's real. And he had a test he made up in 1950. He said, if the computer is real, if you have somebody buy a room, he didn't think computers could talk. But he thought that people could read what a computer said. He said, you have somebody read what it says, and the other person doesn't know that it's a machine. He thinks it's a person. That's, he says, is reality. That's real, that's analog. And this is what digital becomes. When you're more than digital, you are analog. So that gives our customers can have the advantages of analog, which is higher print quality. You have die house quality solids which digital has always had problems with solids. That's one reason why a lot of sports teams have to come to us because they need clean, clean solids that go for a long time the same color. This is not digital's thing. You need color consistency, as I've said before, from first meter to last meter, left to right, one order today to next order next month. And you need a better price because analog with volume has a better price. So that we give our customers, but we also give them digital. The advantages of digital. The advantages of digital, of course, being small quantities that you can have, and also have it anywhere you want. You want it? We have a digital machine in our office in China. Oh yeah, I didn't mention that. One of the things we also makes us unique is that we have a network of partners and agents around the world, which have a very, it's like a family, so if you're dealing with like if a retailer or something says, hey, you know, I want to produce my things, I want to get the, the fabrics coming from there, but I'm going to actually produce the curtains or the, the garments in this country, I say, okay, I got a friend there and I got a friend there. We have a calendar there, we have a digital printer there, and the other guy can do this because he's got a connection to that. So we offer this network, but because we have this network, we're able also to say, well, this network will become digitalized and become a, a form of satellite from our mother company in Germany. So this is what we're able to do. This is more than digital. This is digital becoming more. And uh, basically, how do we do this? Because basically, very important, we need the same inks in digital as we have in analog. The very same ones, not CMYK so that we have more 7% more sp uh, color space. We also have to have basically all those curves I was telling you about. All those curves that are on these things here, those curves have to be reflected. 
we also had to reflect on those films, because those films also have various curves, I can call them. They're called the, the engraving scales, where also are not lineal. There's slight variations. But if you start overlapping colors on each other, which we like to do, that's for photorealistic, then you're going to have those things becoming very mathematically difficult to recreate unless you put those scale in, scales into the system also. And of course, we need more ink density. Normal digital printing doesn't have the density. Like I say, if you had a compact disc music player that could play in the quality of a record that you hear, a 45 record or a 78 record, basically, that compact disc would probably be newspaper because you have to have so much more data, more data, because of the, it's a wave, it's not steps. So this is what we've done for that, and basically I say that's kind of like the point of what it allows our customers to have same-day samples, wherever they are. And so we say in New York, there are a guy in his office, he's got that on his desk also, he can make a sample, he brings them over in the afternoon, same thing in China, same thing in Taiwan, same thing in Bangladesh, same thing in uh, many places. Turkey, uh, it's, like I say, we're in all the places. We can have sales and samples being matched anywhere too from various locations, depending on speed and timing. And of course the bulk paper, when you want that, that analog quality, that analog price, that analog consistency, then we can bring that within a week anywhere in the world. So that's basically what we're doing. That's all I have to say. That's when digital becomes more than analog. Thank you.